welcome to everyone to, who has joined to this very important international webinar on BT cotton in India myths and realities, which is an evidence-based evaluation being made by acclaimed scientists today. In this webinar today, we have a panel of four eminent scientists who will sift through the data as well as the reality of our cotton growing conditions to let us know what is their assessment of BT cotton in India. The webinar has received tremendous response from all over and we have participants uh, here, not just from India, but uh, uh, many parts of the world. And we have a galaxy of agricultural scientists uh, and uh, many farmers here. We have bureaucrats, we have activists, and we have media representatives too. Thank you for uh, all of you for joining us today. In the chat box, we are flashing the live streaming channels of this webinar. And it would be great if you post their, uh, their links on your personal Facebook pages, Twitter handles, and so on. Uh, that will ensure that we can reach out to many more people. It has been 20 years since the BT cotton began to be cultivated in India, both legally and illegally. And to this day, it is the only GM crop approved in India. As you know, there has been an indefinite moratorium on BT brinjal imposed in 2010. As most of you might know, dozens of GM crops are in the pipeline, uh, pipeline of experimentation and approval in India. A new BT brinjal with an event uh, called Event 142, Delhi University's herbicide tolerant GM mustard, Monsanto's GM maize with herbicide tolerance and insect resistance are all waiting in the pipeline. Meanwhile, we hear that several institutes have started developing gene edited crops while regulations are still being finalized. We are also aware of lakhs of hectares of illegal HD cotton cultivation happening across the country. We often hear our policy makers and decision makers make sweeping and hyped statements on how BT cotton has been a grand success in India. Ministers also say the same thing on the floor of the parliament. On the other hand, our prime minister is exhorting uh, farmers in the country to protect mother earth, phase out agrochemicals. Uh, he is talking about Atmanirbharata or self-reliance. We have the current central government as well as many state governments make investments on agroecology based schemes and programs. Uh, we have nearly all farmers unions asking for the government not to approve any GM crops or foods in India. Meanwhile, we also hear regularly about the regulatory failures and lacunae and regulatory decisions that are not based on scientific evidence or proper risk assessment. In this background, uh, we, Center for Sustainable Agriculture and Jatan, both of us which have enormous ground level experience of establishing alternatives to unsustainable technologies, both of which work with uh, scientific rigor and have embraced uh, postmodern science have decided to organize this international webinar. We did a similar event in 2012, reviewing 10 years of BT cotton experience uh, in India. Uh, let me briefly uh, introduce the distinguished speakers in the order in which they will speak. Detailed introductions have been posted on the web page and links are available in the chat box. Dr. Peter Kenmore is a well-known entomologist who is quite familiar with uh, the Indian agriculture and uh, farmers. He was earlier in the FAO representative in India. Professor Andrew Paul Gurdjieff is uh, considered as one of the best quantitative cotton systems ecologists in the world. He's a senior emeritus professor in the College of Natural Resources at the University of California at Berkeley in USA. Dr. Keshav Kranti is a well-known name in India. He used to be the director of ICR's uh, Central Institute of Cotton Research uh, or CICR in Nagpur. And he, is the head of uh, technical information section of the International Cartel Advisory Committee or ICAC based in Washington, USA. Dr. Hans Seren, fourth speaker, uh, our fourth speaker is a World Food Prize uh, laureate. He's also a laureate of Right Livelihood Award and was the co-chair of the UN World Bank process called IAASTD or the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science and Technology for Development. He has an MSc in Agronomy, Plant Breeding and a PhD in Biocontrol. I welcome our distinguished speakers to this webinar. I sincerely thank them for taking the uh, effort to make all this uh, possible from all over the being uh, across timelines. And uh, today, uh, I uh, welcome them to share their analysis. 
Uh, before the presentations begin, some logistical announcement. This webinar has hundreds of participants, as you can see, uh, like in any lecture hall based seminar. We are not in a position to allow conversations in the chat box when the presentations are underway. You can, however, send your questions to the admins who will pass the information to me and so I can put forth to the speakers. We are also not putting on the videos of all participants because we, do, we don't want to overload this system. So I request all the participants to accept the speakers to switch off their videos and uh, mute their audio as well. And uh, uh, because uh, this can help us to run the sessions uh, without any interruptions. We have few volunteers who can help you out. Please uh, put in, in the chat box uh, your questions and requests. The webinar will be in English and our volunteers will keep on posting mm. important points explained by each speaker in Hindi in the chat box. And uh, the speakers will have about 12 to 13 minutes uh, each, and we will keep 30 minutes for the discussions towards the end. Live streaming is happening on several social media pages, and this is to acknowledge audience uh, interest and participation uh, there also. Thank you for viewing this. We have some volunteers in the social media pages, and we requested them to send the questions here. So even if you are watching on the social media, please do post your questions. We'll start the webinar now. May I request uh, the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Peter Canmo, to make this presentation now. Thank you. Thank you very Dr. much. Peter Canmo. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Raman Jani Yulu. And it's a great pleasure to uh, join uh, back in India. And I hope there's a good response and interaction. Um, I'm now going to share presentation, hopefully. Hmm. Yes, okay. Are you... Can you maximize it? Can you put the I'm, full screen, I'm working please? on it. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. Okay. Um, uh, my background is, as well as, uh, you know, having, having worked for periods uh, between three weeks and three years over, over an overall period of about 40 years working in India, working in more than 30 districts, usually in rice. Um, but my original background and specialty was in uh, ecology, particularly of rice systems uh, and of uh, pest control and IPM. So from that perspective, uh, BT hybrid cotton is a pest control technology. It's not uh, a salvation to yield. It's not a salvation to uh, production. It's a pest control technology. And now it's getting to be actually quite an aging, an older pest control technology. And we're seeing some of the typical signs of this, both in terms of secondary pest problems and in terms of resistance in pest populations um, making the actual BT toxin ineffective in the field. Um, this is the, unfortunately for the world, uh, this is the same thing that happened uh, with uh, a number of insecticides, uh, insecticide molecules. I'm listing on the slide you can see now, I think six of them or so. Um, these are classics, and I put them up in particular because they have a special relationship often with India. DDT, of course, has pride of place. Now, I've got the, just for to keep people's attention, I've, I've got the uh, models of the molecular models of each of these and the molecular weight in the now standard units of Daltons. So DDT is a famous uh, pesticide insecticide molecule. It is banned for all uses in the world, except for control of malaria for public health. And given that exemption under the Stockholm Convention, India is by far the largest producer of DDT, even though it's a persistent organic pollutant with intercontinental uh, transfer. So DDT keeps on pouring into the world uh, and India has a particular place in, in keeping that going, even though there are many alternatives for the control of malaria mosquitoes. Second one, very familiar in India is benzene hexachloride or BHC. One form of it is sometimes called lindane. 
It's related to DDT, and it's a byproduct of industrial coke production. That's a, a, a carbon fuel uh, in India. So it, it was something very easy to make. It is banned by the Stockholm Convention. And so eventually in the mid 1990s, thanks to regulatory courage uh, by the government of India, uh, it was then uh, finally moved out of India and, and banned. Then we have endosulfan, another relative to the chlorinated hydrocarbons, which uh, is highly toxic in aquatic systems and has posed serious health hazards, including in Kerala and Philippines and other places. The fourth one is well known to everyone, I'm sure, at the meeting, monocrotophos, a chlorinated, uh, uh, sorry, an organophosphate compound with a very high human uh, and toxicity. Uh, I believe that India is, again, the largest producer of monocrotophos. It's, again, it's restricted uh, by several conventions, including the, um, the Rotterdam Prior Informed Consent Convention, and it has caused secondary pest release. You'll be hearing about some of that later in cotton, but also in rice and other crops. Then we have carbaryl, which was previously the most widely used carbamate. And as everyone in this meeting knows, the precursor is isothiocyanate, which created it at Bhopal uh, 35, six years ago, the largest industrial accident, sorry, yes, the largest industrial accident uh, in human history. Finally, imidacloprid, uh, neonicotinoid, widely used, most widely used insecticide now globally, extremely toxic to honeybees and other pollinators, and used extensively in cotton as a prophylactic seed treatment. So in each of these, you see a molecule of a certain size being, and it'll be, it had the same sequence of ecological problems in the field with resistance, secondary pest release, uh, human and domestic animal toxicity. Now, here I've also put the, a, a form of the molecule we're interested in. Uh, this is the one I could get a picture of. It's the BT cry 2 aa toxin. The reason I put it up twofold. Number one, it is a molecule, just like all the other insecticides. It's treated as if it was insecticide in the development and marketing by uh, the corporations. The only difference is it's about, I don't know, uh, several hundred times bigger than the other molecules. That's as nature as a, bio, as a bio produced uh, molecule, but it again joins the ranks of other insecticides following the same cycle of crisis. Um, <clears throat> the way each molecule went through, uh, they were packaged uh, biochemically, legally, and commercially before they're released and promoted, both by private sector and by uh, government agencies with an interest. I use here a picture of a pesticide shop uh, in Guntur district because I visited it. That was in the years long before BT arrived. But the, uh, the point is, is that this, this is the way these chemicals are moved out, even though they're toxic, uh, and cause ecological side effects to uh, the smallest farmers as well as to uh, large scale uh, wealthier farmers uh, it, across the world. And so corporate and public policy actors often claim increases but deliver no more than temporary pest suppression. And this has tr been true for all the molecules you've seen. It's true not just in cotton, it's true also in rice, it's true in cabbage and other vegetable crops, it is true in orchard, orchard crops like apples. This is a universal set of phenomena. I'm going to particularly look at uh, well, yield increases, but no more than temporary pest suppression that has been seen in, in problems with even with Bt, where yields decline after uh, in, in some cases in the first year, in some cases after three or four years, you see in the same place standard yield declines. I'm going to talk a little bit more about secondary pest release. You're going to hear about this from Professor Andrew Gutierrez. In cotton, I'm going to show you very quickly a rice case from Asia. Uh, this is a secondary pest release. Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, all the, the brown rice area is dead. This is the rice brown plant hopper, Nila parvata lugans. Every one of these was created by insecticides. 
the young man in the middle of the top row is uh, holding a bottle of monocrotophos, <clears throat> which is a category 1A, 1B uh, WHO toxin, and you can see he has no personal protective equipment. In the lower right is, a, uh, again, a picture of uh, Brown Planthopper released in fields uh, <clears throat> near Adutorai in Tamil Nadu, in Tanjore uh, district. And uh, it's here particularly because you see standing in the middle, uh, Dr. V. Raghunathan, formerly pet, pet <clears throat> the pest control advisor, plant protection advisor, excuse me, for the government of India, who unlike most of his predecessors and successors stands uh, barefoot in rice paddies listening to farmers who have this problem with the secondary pest release. Um, again, in rice, how, what's the mechanism? At the bottom, you have the pest on the lower left and then the rest of the organisms here are natural enemies. You can see two of them eating brown plant hoppers. When they are destroyed, as the upper graph show, when those natural enemies are suppressed, the population of the plant hoppers explodes. And that's a secondary pest release. The ecosystem in rice is wonderfully complex, including the blue part is that which takes place under the water uh, surface and the others here are on the rice plants on land. But it's a complex ecosystem that gets disrupted by the pesticides. Uh, now, part of the job, in managing an IPM strategy is to regulate pesticides better. Um, this shows uh, pesticide use from 1955 to about 2013 for India uh, in technical grade, which shows it increasing steadily, fairly sharply, and then moderately sharply uh, from the mid 1950s until the mid 1990s which point the finance ministry imposed a 10% excise tax on all pesticides at the factory gate, uh, but also at the same time, the, the Central Insecticide Committee uh, and, the, and the regulatory apparatus uh, was very good at um, getting rid of BHC. And between those two things, the amount of pesticides overall used in India shrank uh, dramatically. The thing that's of interest to us today as well is here you can see where the first plantings of BT cotton happened. And the first plantings happened after the bulk of the reduction in pesticides. So that what you have, it, when one talks about BT cotton uh, reducing pesticide use, in fact, the bulk of the change happened before BT cotton came on the scene. In fact, you can see some pesticide levels going up, or total use levels nationally going up after BT cotton. So recurrent crises of the kind that I've talked about spark citizens, public action, and then sprouted, I call it, ecological field research by committed scientists. So the kind of crisis that we see here, this is shot in India of a small child uh, spraying in a field. Then as just as an icon of citizen public action, this is Rachel Carson uh, at the Rocky Shore where she lived in Maine. And then over here, we have scientists working with farmers directly in field, in this case, in cotton fields. <clears throat> when the research is taken on by farmers, so they do it, they create locally adapted agroecological strategies, whether it's zero-based natural farming, farmer field schools, self-help groups, or a number of other social groups. And here you see action pictures of farmers doing science and sharing their scientific observations with other farmers. Finally, their agroecology is gathering global support from citizens groups, governments, all the way up to the UNFAO, where agroecology has been the subject of two big global meetings and five regional meetings, the total attendance uh, the, the, the latest one of those, the global meeting, was 800 uh, international delegates who came to talk about agroecology. Their robust solutions, the farmers' robust local solutions in Indian cotton, do not require any new molecules, including that nice-looking nice gigantic uh, Cry2AA molecule. That's not what's required. What you're going to be hearing about today are where the kinds of alternative practices uh, are more sustainable and do a better job of taking care of pest problems. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Dr. Peter. Uh, I think your presentation uh, was very reflective of our own experience. Uh, by equating pesticides and uh, GM crops, uh, the, particularly the BT cotton, the approach to pest management uh, is unsustainable by taking an approach to killing. I think that was brought out uh, very well in your uh, uh, presentation. And this has been the experience of India. And uh, we also have seen uh, where pesticides are not used much uh, and uh, uh, people made a shift from pesticides to uh, more agroecological approaches like non-pesticidal management, the pest uh, problem has come down significantly. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing this out very well in your presentation. May I now invite uh, Dr. Andrew Paul Gitteris to make his presentation. Uh, we are operating the slides for him. Dr. Andrew. Thank yes. you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. I became interested in uh, cotton in India when I start reading about all of the suicides. And I helped uh, an, uh, an Israeli filmmaker develop uh, the film called Bitter Scene. I've worked since about 1972 and it's been worldwide. South America, Central America, North America, Africa, and uh, Australia, and now India. Uh, next slide. I had included my um, close colleague, Luigi Ponti, in the title. Dr. Robert Vandenbosch was my major professor, and he left a legacy of insight into pest management. He influenced me, he influenced Peter Kenmore, and he influenced Hans Herren. And one of the first experiments that he ran on cotton was in a 260 hectare experiment in the San Joaquin Valley of California. You see in the map that circle, because farmers were thinking that a small little bug called Lycus hesperus was responsible for the very variations in yield. And so what they, the only technology they had to control it was to spray for it. So if the black line represents the background population, the red line represents what happens when you spray. The downturn arrow, it goes to zero, and then very quickly they explode off the chart. So we call that pest resurgence. Next slide, please. Now, when you apply these pesticides, as Peter was saying, not only do you uh, get pest resurgence, but you get pests that are normally very rare in the environment in cotton, such as, for example, beet armyworm or cabbage looper. And you see the downturn arrows in some of the treatments, and you see the explosion of, of these pests. Next. So you start out with ligus bug, which you considered a pest, you put on insecticides, and all of a sudden you come up with a problem with bollworm, which is much greater than ligus bug ever could be. And in fact, it turns out that ligus bug is not a pest at all. It causes almost no damage in cotton, and that the yields in the untreated check were higher any of the insecticide treatments. And these were in huge one square mile blocks of cotton that had been left untreated. So farmers were spending money on pest control to lose money. My economist colleague, Uri Regev, called it the first documented case of market failure in agriculture. Next. So let's explain. Normally I would write uh, models, simulation models, computer models, but uh, these are pictorial sorts of things. So assume that in this, this square, the circles are Ligus hesperus, the triangles are all the natural enemies you see at the bottom. And then there's this red star that is a secondary pest. Next, when we apply insecticides, we create a vacuum and pests migrate back in. Next, and what happens is that we also kill off all the natural enemies. Next. And we end up releasing these secondary pests, which are very common 
when the natural enemies are operative to release the reproductive potential. So you would get something like bollworm that could lay 500 eggs in a 10 day period. So the reproductive potential is just enormous and the damage they cause is enormous. Next slide. We started with ligus, we end up with bollworm, we get mites, all kinds of caterpillars and so on. So we, we cause ecological disruption. Next. Next, there we go. Uh, Indian cotton has its panoply of, of uh, pests or, or insects that are feeding on cotton. Most of them are secondary pests. They're kept under control by the suite of natural enemies, which we'll show in the next, sli in the next slide. Next. But the real key pest is pink bollworm. When you plant long season cotton, you must protect that cotton against pink bollworm. If you do not, it will destroy your crop. And in pre-BT uh, cotton era, they would use insecticides and they would end up with outbreaks of what they call American bollworm. Um, so both of them are very damaging, but bollworm is even more damaging, I think, than Pink bollworm. Pink bollworm is relatively easy to control. Next. So let's look at uh, irrigated long season cotton before uh, BT cotton. It's planted sometime in the spring, it germinates, it starts producing the first crop and then a second cycle. And depending upon the irrigation and range, you can even produce a third cycle. Next. at the, what pink bollworm interacts with cotton. We see that uh, it emerges from it's, it's in as larvae and, and, and prepupae. And that pattern coincides and overlaps with the availability of fruit from irrigated cotton. And toward the end, it starts producing dormant uh, um, stages which will come around the next year and infest your cotton. Next. Next. Now, rain-fed cotton uh, germinates with monsoon rains. But if you look at the emergence pattern of, of pink bollworm from dormancy, rain-fed cotton and this emergence pattern do not overlap. Next. But if you had flights coming in from other sources, say from irrigated cotton, they infest uh, uh, rain-fed cotton. Next. And so before BT, the only thing that there was available to control it were insecticides. Next. And you end up with this huge bollworm problem. So the solution is next is BT cotton and big question mark. Next. So that kind of sets what the phenology is about in a very simple way. Now we could normally write a mathematical model to project this and that's what we actually do. So let's review what's happening uh, <clears throat> with the onset of, uh, of BT cotton in, in 2002. Dr. Granti will cover this in greater detail, I'm sure. But yields plateaued starting in around 2006. Of course, BT cotton is very good against pink bollworm and against bollworm. And so the applications of insecticide for those two decreased. Total insecticide after about 2006 started to increase again and reached more than 2002 levels by about uh, 2013. But BT cotton does not control all of the potential pests that are in cotton. And among these are things like white flies and mealybugs and jacids and other things, hemipteran pests, sucking pests. And insecticide use then started increasing. And by about 2012, it was almost entirely to control these induced pests. 
Normally they would not be a pest in cotton. Next. So Indian farmers <clears throat> were creating their own market failure. They were spending money on pest control to lose money. Next. And in addition to that, they were on a biotech and an insecticide treadmill. Next. But if we wanna see generally what happens when you apply insecticide in cotton in India, you take the national data for India, you yield plotted against um, kilograms of, of cotton, of, of insecticide, and you see a trend line. And it basically says that for every kilogram of insecticide use, you lose about 200 kilograms of cotton. Now this is an oversimplification because it's more complicated, but it, what it does is it shows the trend line. And if you were to go to any of the state data, you would find similar kinds of relationships. Some would be tighter and some would not be uh, so tight. Next, please. If you like uh, Maharashtra, and I, I apologize for my pronunciation of Indian names, yields are fairly low, it's 350 kilograms. And even national yields at 550 on average, low comparison to all kinds of other countries that are supposedly developing economies. And in the background, you see that BT cotton uh, is increasing in adoption, but again, yield stagnation. Okay, next is. So what I would normally do is I would develop a systems model and that's what we've done for India. We, do, we can basically uh, develop a virtual crop in the computer. We run it with weather and we can parameterize it with the varieties of any particular area. And we can generate the dynamics of the individual plant, of the population of plants and, and its interaction with say pink bollworm or 10 other species that we have in in the model. We can estimate what the field yields are going to be, and we can do it for any region. Next. Now, the kind of output for any location uh, would be indicated by this kind of graph. The lines are the model predictions, and the data uh, are the dots. And it basically partitions how energy is being allocated by the crop to all of these uh, uh, different organs. And when you link them with the pest, you see how the pest is taking energy from the crop and diverting it to its own use and how it starts affecting yield. Next. So let's say we divide the five states of uh, central, South Central India into 2,800 or more grid points, but 38 kilometers square. And we take the daily weather data from 1980 to 2010, and we run the model for all of this period. And we take annual estimates of, of, of lint yield and take the average standard deviations and, and so on, different statistics. And we can see from the color bar, the distribution of predicted yields. As you start getting toward the upper end, you probably areas would be used for other crops, but we did not clip the uh, projections for that. Next. And what this does, visually, you can start seeing that at 350, uh, what the distribution of, of yields might be. And if you take a conservative price for lint cotton of, of say $1.90 per kilogram, the, the income would be about 665. And if you were only growing organic cotton and you put fertilizer and labor into it, the cost would be about 1%. Next. But if you had pests and you had to buy BT seed and insecticide, the cost might be 28% or even more uh, of your total revenue. So pictorially, it enables us to capture uh, kind of what's going on in the different regions. Remember, it's all driven by weather and the model is predicting things uh, of the dynamics of, of crop development. Next. Now, 
lint yield is related to rainfall. That's, that's the dominant uh, driver. Uh, weather, fertilizer, and other things are also uh, important and can move this also around. But with rainfall, you tend to have um, uh, d uh, diminishing returns. Now, if we plot in the bottom graph, millimeters rainfall toward the coefficient of variation, we find that the lower the, ra the rainfall, total rainfall, the higher the variability. And since rainfall is related to, to yield, the lower you are on the rainfall scale, the higher your variability of yield is going to be. So that means that you start getting toward 350 uh, uh, kilograms of, of cotton or, and, and below, uh, your yield variability is gonna be really quite high. Next. And during this time period, for insecticide, fertilizer, seed, labor, increased more than threefold. So you had stagnant yields. Prices are not varying all that much with the exception of uh, 2011 when there was a big spike. And so the farmers trapped between increasing costs and stagnant yield and income. It relates to um, economic distress. Next. So if we look at uh, correcting the statewide data and, and estimating in US dollars, uh, the income per day on yield, we find a straight line. It requires about 110 kilograms of cotton simply to break even. Next, if we take the side data from the Crime Bureau in India, and we correct it for the proportion of these farmers in each of the states that uh, cotton, these suicide uh, data are, 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 are per state. And we correct it to a standard of say a million hectares, it could be a hundred thousand, doesn't really matter. And we plot those against average yield, we find that the higher the yield, the lower the suicide rate and vice versa. If we plot it on net revenue, we get the same kind of trend. And the only outliers appear to be some points from Gujarat. But if we were, were to remove those points, it really wouldn't change the relationship at all. Next. So, in the beginning, we talked about a disaster in cotton in California. It should have been an embarrassment to everybody, but they, had, they didn't know any better. But in the mid-1970s, the Indian pink bullworm invaded the, San Juan, the Imperial Valley of, uh, of California at the, at the bottom of the state. And it was causing incredible damage and reducing yields. So they started spraying with insecticides and they brought the yields up. But at a certain point, they started spraying almost on a basis. So they had a problem with pink bollworm and then they ended up with a problem with bollworm, white flies, budworms, defoliators, black bugs, you name it. Next slide. So somebody came up with a good idea about short season cotton. I don't know that history. Next slide. Now, the way short seed and cotton worked in California was that it was designed to be planted normally at the normal time, but to be harvested before pink bollworm could produce the overwintering forms that would come back and infest the crop the following year. It took a while to figure out how the varieties and to develop them, to wean themselves away from insecticide use. And by 1995, 1994, yields were up to normal, 1,500 or more kilograms per hectare. But then BT cotton came in, next slide, and replaced this short season 
not only uh, cotton. Now, it replaced it because it was an easier technology to implement. They didn't have to plow the field immediately after harvest. They could leave the, the, the stocks in the field for as long as they wanted, and they'd do it at their convenience, quickly uh, more viable. So non-hybrid BT cotton replaced the short season technology, even though that BT cotton was also high density cotton. Next. Next. No, what's this? No, go back one, please. Back. Back. There we go. Now, in India, the researchers uh, at uh, the Cotton Research Station at Nagpur uh, have been working on non hybrid, non high density short season cottons in India. And Dr. Karanthi knows this extremely well because he was there. He was supervising probably a lot of it. And what, when you compare it to the yields for uh, the state, you see that the yields from hybrid, uh, from uh, non-hybrid uh, varieties of, of American varieties, uh, cotton are, are more than double what they would be uh, for the state. And they could either be American varieties or they could be desi cottons. The same trend occurs. And what is obvious is that this is probably just the beginning. Better varieties could be developed, higher yielding, different quality, and so on. They're at the beginning. The question that key puzzled me is why this work wasn't really encouraged, stimulated, and why some of these things weren't put out and implemented. Next slide. So how would it work in India? Well, recall that pink bollworm emerges in the spring and it overlapped with irrigated cotton, but not with short season and definitely not with high density short season cotton. So it wouldn't get infestations from, <clears throat> from uh, these overwintering uh, emerging. Now the short season cotton would uh, shorten the season and it would also to reduce the, the number of, of, of overwintering um, stages that would be formed. And by packing the crops together, the, the plants together of the right variety, the question is not to produce large plants. The, the object is to produce the, the highest yield possible per unit area. And that's what short season cotton uh, would do, short season high density cotton. So if people wanted to use irrigated cotton in India, high density, short season cotton would also work and they would take the California strategy. They would terminate the crop before the overwintering forms could be produced. Next. So there's little overlap between emergence from overwintering and the crop, and that's the solution, simple. Next. And you don't get infestations, next. So BT cotton is not needed, but there is that inherent contradiction and conflict between irrigated and cotton that has to be resolved, next. Next. Oh, one back. So in summary, high density, short season, pure line rain fed cotton has been developed by a top research group in India. It's non GM, it's not hybrid. The yields are two times and they could be better. Income would increase 2.5 fold and with increased yields even more. It promotes seed saving. It greatly reduces insecticide use. It reduces and disrupts the current value capture mechanism of hybrid cotton. Now, I never understood why 
they would plant two plants per meter row or per, per meter square in India because it takes so long to fill the canopy and you might get great big plants, but it takes a long time to reach productivity and you're subjecting yourselves to an awful lot of pests with long season cotton. Now with the development of, of um, these, these varieties, it ameliorates the gamble of the monsoon, but it doesn't eliminate it. Thank you. Ramu, you are on mute. You are on mute. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew. The, uh, you brought out very well the wrong choices being made uh, in promoting this uh, BT technology. And uh, you also showed the correlations between the BT cotton and farmer suicides. Uh, incidentally, it is not just you, but even the government of India admitted it in uh, various places about this issue. And uh, one of the key takeaway from the presentation is also about uh, reducing the duration, uh, making a choice for uh, uh, short duration varieties uh, rather than filling up the entire uh, 220, 240 days in the feed with cotton and uh, changes in the agronomy. I think this is a very important takeaway from this presentation. Now may I invite Dr. Kranti to speak. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Right, thank you so much. Uh, good morning uh, to India. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I immensely enjoyed the presentations by Dr. Kenmore and Dr. Gutierrez. Thank you so much for laying this foundation. I will start with uh, my presentation and what I think are uh, Indian cotton woes. Uh, like primarily, it's about low yields. It's about indiscriminate use of pesticides. It is uh, indiscriminate use of fertilizers, the imbalance, which leads to poor soil health. It is about the low density of uh, the crop. It's about the long season. And finally, again, low yields. So now I will start with this question. Why are we obsessed with PT cotton? Is it, uh, it is just an insecticide that mainly kills the American bollworm? Helicopter armigera in India. Now, the research papers show uh, that yields may have been protected by BT cotton up to a maximum of only 28.2% in India. So therefore, it's a lie if someone believes and says that BT cotton double yields in India. Now, It's widely believed that uh, like technologies such as irrigation, fertilizers, pesticides, mechanization, improved varieties, better agronomy, and GM cotton increase yields. Uh, but in India, even experts have been arguing that it is only BT cotton that has increased yields and none of these, uh, irrespective of whatever. So, however, despite having all these technologies, India ranks uh, poor 36 in cotton yields below all these other countries. Interestingly, now these green bars are Africa, African countries. So India is behind at least four African countries and ranks with three more which is uh, these countries are, uh, it's an Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Benin, Mali, and Uganda. So India keeps on fluctuating with them. And it is, these African countries do not have BT or hybrids or mechanization or irrigation and barely use any fertilizers or pesticides. So um, now these black bars that you see here are the BT growing countries 
Ethiopia and Sudan have been recently included, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Nigeria. But the other blue countries are the non-BT countries. So what you have here is the list of main cotton growing countries where in India ranks 22nd. And again, uh, these countries that are ahead of India, uh, eight countries are with BT and 13 countries are without BT. Many of my colleagues would ask me, do these countries use more uh, fertilizers, more pesticides? Why is it that they get better yields? Now, it's, it's interesting that some of these countries have this gold standard of uh, planting geometry at 90 by 10. Now, it could be mechanization which has caused that, but certainly all these top yielding countries, highest yielding countries have a common spacing. But then, do these countries actually use a lot of uh, fertilizers? Uh, while African countries barely use fertilizers, all these other countries use less fertilizers than India to produce more cotton. Now let us get to BT and the bollworm in India. Until 1978, Helicorpa armigera was not a major pest of cotton in India. There are textbooks and uh, even while students, we'd studied that. It is uh, insecticides like the synthetic pyrethroids with which we created a monster. Pyrethroids were introduced in 1980 and also probably with the increased use of American cotton from 1980 onwards, uh, it, it could be the hybrids even, uh, that this pest became a monster and a major problem. And of course, then came BT cotton in 2002 uh, as... Uh, savior of cotton against helicorpa armigera. That's how it is perceived. Now let us take a look at uh, the official data to show what has been happening with cotton in India. Yields here were equivalent to Africa. Um, even now they're not really better than uh, many of the African countries. But after this, yields did jump. Now, this increase happened in these three years. Interestingly, this happened when more than 90% of the area was under non-BT cotton here. So now, therefore, I would consider 2005 as the pre-BT era. Now, please remember this line here from 2005 onwards to 2011, this has a spectacular increase. Many of these changes have happened exactly during this time. So 2006, according to me, was a landmark year for BT cotton because BT cotton started in North India in 2005, 2006. Volga 2 was introduced into North India in 2006. Two more BT events from Nath seeds and JK seeds were also introduced in 2006. So what do you expect? You expect that yield should have increased after 2006 when BT cotton area increased, yield should have increased as well as insecticides should have decreased after 2006. Now, despite all these new exciting introductions and the spectacular change in BT cotton area, yield stagnated at about 500 kilograms per hectare, which is again at almost along with Africa. So apart from this, insecticide usage also increased after 2005, which you will soon see in the next slides. I will focus mainly on the changes after 2005. This I would consider as a non-BT era because this change happened when 90% of the area was under non-BT cotton. Now, the question is, did BT hybrids increase yields? This graph has all the data points and it shows that BT area here and the BT adoption has almost no correlation with the yields. As you can see, the yields were the same, almost the same with high BT adoption between 80 to 100% with the low BT adoption rate. So uh, there's a very, very poor correlation. It doesn't really tell us anything whether BT adoption was actually related to yields or not. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's almost clear from this graph that uh, it, it wasn't. But then why didn't the BT cotton area correlate with the yields? That's such a big question. Let's examine that. 
almost by 1999 itself, uh, Helikorpa Army Jara was actually uh, coming down on and off. That's because of the decline in the synthetic pyrethroids. We had major projects from the government of India and uh, there was a lot of emphasis. And with that, it was coming down. But then it's also because those were very cheap insecticides, farmers were still using them. Now, as you can see here in North India, except on and off and in Central India and South India, it is below ETL. This BETL is below ETL. So these green areas essentially meant that Helicorpa armigera wasn't causing problems except here and there, except for these where uh, at least once in the season, it was above economic thresholds. So now the question is, because the scientific data show that non-BT in many parts of the country was no longer ravaged by Helicorpa armigera, thus raising another question, was BT actually um, benefiting in these regions in the absence of Helicorpa armigera? If it was not BT adoption, then what is it that would have caused the yields? I mean, that is a big question. So let's take a look at this next one. Interestingly, after 2004, this mountain here is the fertilizer usage. And these are all from government data. These are official data. So fertilizer use doubled between 2003 to 2011. Strangely and surprisingly, many scientists in India argue that this double fertilizer usage was not responsible for increasing cotton yields in India. Amazing. And I, 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 uh, I just failed to understand what exactly that means. But uh, this, despite the fact that there is a very good correlation of yields and fertilizer usage, it's actually more than 0.42 because after a point, uh, the soils really stopped responding to the fertilizers after about 2011 and 2012. So irrespective of how much fertilizer you were dumping onto the soil, they weren't responding. But otherwise, that correlation was really spectacular between 2003 and 2011. Now, another important factor that helped cotton in India is the addition of 19.2 lakh hectares of irrigated fertile land in eight years after 2003. Now, exactly when the area of BT cotton was on the spectacular rise, but strangely, again, many scientists argue that this fertile irrigated area also didn't help to increase yields. Again, in, uh, I do not know how to convince them, but this is exactly what was happening. This, is, uh, th this black line here is the irrigated area. And these are again from the official figures. About 40 lakh, which is 4 million hectares were added out of which 1.9 million hectares were irrigated fertile land. Now let us come to uh, the challenges. Within six years of introducing the two gene BT cotton, BT resistant pink bollworm emerged as a monster in India with high levels of resistance. This is our paper from my group and to Bolgard two. So it is, it, it barely took six years and now pink bollworm munches Bolgard two like a chocolate. And which resulted in increased levels of infestation. These bars that you see, I mean, it is 30% infestation, 70% infestation. My colleagues will keep on, uh, would keep on telling me that all the destructive sampling, whatever they would open would contain pink bollworms. So BT cotton was supposed to reduce chemical insecticide usage, but the impressive increase in BT area also coincided with a significant increase in insecticide usage against sucking pests. And after 2011, insecticide usage also started increasing against the pink bollworm here because resistance was detected in 2011. So finally, what we find is insecticides have been increasing. This is in quantitative terms. It is the metric tons. So it is from, I mean, the sucking pest from about 4,000 metric tons, they went on to about 10,000 metric tons. And this is the quantity in India. But please remember, because the area in BT cotton also increased from here. So therefore it's important to take a look at the kilograms of pesticides per hectare. And this is what it is. Like I said, after 2006, uh, you'll still see that there is an upward curve. So it is not as if with the increase uh, in the BT adoption rate, usage of pesticide in cotton decreased. It, it kept on increasing. And these are quantitative terms per hectare. 
So there can't be better data than this to show that insecticides actually increased. Now, consequently, the cost of production also increased after 2006. So this line, you would see that as the adoption rate of Bt increased, the cost of production also increased. This, this includes the seed costs, it's, this includes fertilizers, this includes irrigation costs, it, it included the labor wages because it became very labor intensive and everything. So the cost of production increased. What are the repercussions with this? As you can see, the cost of production is actually more than double. I mean, it could be 2.6 fold. But then what happened subsequently was net returns declined to negative here. This orange line is the market value. Fortunately, uh, like Professor Gutierrez uh, mentioned, that uh, uh, like in 2011, uh, the prices were really good. Otherwise, I really do not know what would have happened. But nevertheless, the production cost kept increasing, but uh, the market value also matched. But we did have these two seasons, 2014, 2015, where the net returns were negative. And this is problematic indeed. This causes a great deal of stress. So to summarize, yields stagnated despite double fertilizer use. In six years, the ping bollworm and many sucking pests became new headaches, as a result of which insecticide use has been on the rise after 2006. Cost of cultivation increased and net returns have started becoming negative. All this despite the fact that the Indian farmer has been paying a hefty royalty of more than 7,437 crores. This is about $1.28 billion, billion US dollars. So um, even in 2014 and 2015, Indian farmers paid about 1,200 crores, 600 crores in 2014 and about 588 crores in 2015, but they lost. So let's take a look at uh, this question again. Is BT cotton the answer for India's cotton woes? Like I said, India's cotton woes are low yields, uh, degraded soils, long duration, low density, and uh, like indiscriminate use of pesticides and fertilizers. Is BT cotton the answer to that? I mean, so I put in as big a font that I could, I would say emphatically no. But then India needs sustainable solutions. Does India have the answers? But again, emphatically say, yes, India has all the answers and these answers are within India. I would first start with the native desi cotton species. The second focus would be on soil health. Third would be on conserving agroecology, which is native friendly insects. God gave ecology, so we need to preserve them and use the Indian native neem tree, as Azadiracta indica. And finally, it's the high density short season cotton for high yields. Now, these are some of uh, the things, there could be more, but uh, these are the core strategies. I would uh, like to talk a little bit on desi species, which is Gossypium arboreum. Desi species is native to Indian soil. The British introduced American cotton species in 1790 in India, and because the American cotton fibers suited the mills in Lancashire and Manchester, and tried for 157 years to replace desi cotton in India, but they failed. In 1947, when they left, India had 97% of the area under desi cotton, which is a mix of Gossypium, uh, Gossypium arboreum plus Gossypium uh, like herbaceum. But where they failed, after they left, after the British left India, we Indians succeeded in pushing down the de desi area to less than 1%. Desi was preferred by our parents I mean, even in 1947, why is it that uh, my parents or their parents wouldn't listen to the British? Why didn't that happen? It's simply because the desi species, Gossypium arboreum primarily, is robust against insects, diseases, and drought. It is just that the fiber required to be long and strong. Now, I'm proud to present this slide on behalf of our scientists, Dr. Ansinkar, Dr. Deshpande, Dr. Beg, Dr. Dev Sarkar, Dr. Chinchane, a full range of them, I am their fan. Primarily because they achieved the impossible, Desi used to be known for 18 mm short staple fiber. And here they created varieties 32 mm, amazing. And now they're talking of 33, 34 mm, not just the length, but the strength and absolutely amazing micronet. 
So they are my inspiration. Indian scientists, I mean, not just this group, but the others developed a range of these desi varieties with long staple cotton, which is in some cases better than uh, some of the best uh, uh, like BT cotton hybrids. So better than 29 mm. And here the micron air is good enough. The strength also is good enough, but importantly, the yields were really good. So this is what we were looking for. There is still uh, some way to go. I mean, but then it needs support from the government, support from the scientists and the will to do well. Now, is it just enough to produce that cotton? What does the industry think about it? The spinning industry, where this cotton goes there. So we got this uh, cotton tested with Vardaman mills. This happened while I was the director there and I was very keen to get the testing done. These green bars that you see are all those desi cotton varieties which performed better than one of the best BT cotton hybrids called Ajit 155. This is the yellow bar. So all these desi cotton fibers pass the spinning test with the spinning consistency index. And the mill didn't believe, Vardaman mills didn't believe that this cotton came from desi cotton. They were asking which hybrid this is. So it was amazing. I mean, uh, I was jumping up nevertheless. Now there is yet another technology. I would call it a global gold standard uh, with 10 centimeters uh, plant to plant distance, yet a simple technology. It is high density planting of short season varieties. And uh, like, thank you, Professor Gutierrez for, uh, I mean, for highlighting that. In one of the trials, one of my colleagues, Dr. Udikere also compared, I mean, uh, this table is just a small summary, some examples wherein uh, uh, like some of these non-BT varieties have been tested under high density with low density. And what they found was yield increases. These are very modest yield increases, but they did find almost doubling of the yields in some. I didn't want to hide that, but it's, it's a fact that there is hardly any paper which says that where they use this kind of spacing that they got less yields. And uh, Dr. Udikeri's paper uh, uh, with uh, Arsha here, um, he speaks about better yields of uh, the American cotton varieties over Bolgard II hybrid cotton. So now let me get to the next slide here. Are hybrids suitable for high density? In my view, they're not ideal candidates and Indian woes of low yields would still continue. Seeds would be unaffordable, the low density planting and the long duration, which actually gets to 240 days in India, equivalent to two seasons, it's miserable because it makes the crop very vulnerable to insect pests and nutrient deficiencies. Most of the bowls are formed post-monsoon, so they don't form, they get aborted. Ping bowl one damage would continue, high fertilizer usage would continue. So do we really want this hybrid era to continue? I would say, let's look for alternatives. And again, with BT hybrids, to me, it becomes clear. A clear observation is that Despite being saturated with BT hybrids, the average yield of rain-fed Maharashtra, with Professor Gutierrez also showed in his elegant slide, the average rain-fed Maharashtra yields are less than resource-poor rain-fed African countries. The average of Africa is 350, and Maharashtra gets 350. Africa doesn't have BT. Maharashtra has BT fertilizers, 222 kilograms per hectare. Africa barely has, in some countries, it is less than 10 grams. So, what are we talking about really? So the clear observation here is that despite being saturated with BT hybrids, the average yields are low. So that essentially means hybrids are unsuitable for rain-fed conditions. Hybrids do represent value capture to force recurrent purchases. And only seed companies, I mean, in India have been promoting hybrids. Uh, in, in China, there, there are no hybrids, less than 5% area that we have two hybrids. Uh, China and Pakistan tested and abandoned F1 hybrids. And China has an area of less than 5% in the BT hybrid. So I really do not know where this hybrid story is taking with India being exclusively obsessed with hybrids for high yields, but ending up even after 20 years with low yields and yields which are just equivalent to Africa. So in conclusion, friends, I would like to emphasize again that India, I firmly believe, has all the answers. It is just a matter of self-belief it's a matter of science, it's a matter of efforts, it's a matter of our time. And I'm sure if not today, maybe in the years to come, we will win, all of us will win and let us win. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Dr. Kranti. Uh, you are amazing. Uh, you, like right from the college days, we always used to look <laughs> up to you. And uh, as a scientist in CICR, uh, you really set a path to look into how uh, a scientist should work. Thank you very much. You, it was a Thank wonderful you. presentation. Uh, and uh, as you all can see, he's, uh, he's using the, pub, uh, the publicly available official data and uh, making a clear analysis of uh, what went wrong, how we went wrong. And uh, I think uh, this uh, sets a trend and I think people, other people also start looking at the data and make the analysis which would be useful for people. And uh, as I uh, see the presentation, I can also see uh, these trends which uh, Kranti was presenting also has larger implications, say uh, increasing fertilizer use, increasing water use has uh, ecological and climate change impacts as well. Say every fertilizer, every kilo of fertilizer use increase, increases the burden of subsidy, increases the burden on environment. So all these I think is something which we need to understand uh, very, very clearly. Similarly, increasing the water use, the water footprint of cotton is often ignored. Uh, recently, the study by Nabad uh, about uh, water footprints also um, cotton has a very larger water footprint and the area under cotton increasing also has a serious implications which we need to look into. And uh, the questions of seed sovereignty, particularly uh, moving towards hybrid was brought out very well. And uh, also about the monopolies gained by one MNC. So I think this is uh, something which is very, very important. And uh, in this context, I also congratulate the entire team which worked on uh, evolving the PA812 variety, which was mentioned by Kranti. Uh, the team, uh, some of the team members are in this webinar uh, on behalf of organizers and all other participants. I congratulate them. I think keep up good work and uh, people look for you. And uh, particularly in this significant uh, time, this is time and in this time, it is a significant uh, milestone. And uh, I also hope uh, states like Telangana, which is talking about increasing the area under cotton, will learn lessons from the, the what Kranti made a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kranti, once again. And uh, now I invite Dr. Hans Saran to present. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Good morning, everybody. Uh, many friends are uh, there listening. So I'm very happy uh, to recognize quite a number of, of people. Um, I'm going to follow, you know, the very good presentation by uh, Peter Kenmore, my good friend, uh, Andrew Gutierrez, also Andy Gutierrez, um, and uh, Kesho Kanchi. So what um, I have a PowerPoint also. So let's see uh, if I can share my screen. I just have to share screen, uh, share. Um, okay, so let me get uh, over here. So, so um, can you see it? I hope uh, this is okay now. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is, you know, tackling the cause and not the symptoms. And I think that what we have heard right now uh, from the three presentation is that we have a major issue here of um, not really listening to science. And um, from having been, you know, from being a scientist, agronomist, entomologist, biology control specialist, I, I went um, further and started to work on looking at uh, policies, because uh, like you and uh, many, uh, I think that we need science to inform policies. And clearly what's happening out there right now in India, but in the rest of the world, is that uh, the politicians, the decision makers, are not listening to science, to the facts. And um, right now, you know, you, you wonder uh, from what we have heard, all the evidence we have with all this uh, data, you wonder why are we still pushing uh, BT hybrid cotton, for example? Why is this with all this evidence? But I have learned the lessons the hard ways too over, the, over my career um, is that, you know, the opposition, the people, agribusiness, always think that, you know, our evidence is not good enough and their evidence 
for the GMOs, for um, pesticides, for more fertilizer, uh, is better than ours. And I think that I, again, looking at those presentation, uh, I'm sure that all uh, you of you who are participating in this webinar uh, see, you know, that they're convinced that this is good science and it needs to be influencing uh, decision making. I'm going to take okay, this to a little bit. Dr. Hans, can you use the slideshow, yes? please? Can you use the slideshow, uh, please? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, uh, it is yeah. on. So I'm not sure exactly why. Um... No, on the left side. On the, on the left side, on the top, you can see. Oh, I use slide. Yeah, okay, sorry. All right, there we are. Yeah. Because it will be looking bigger. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, all right, good. So, um, what I, what I want to show you is the, uh, go on to the, the bigger picture because what's happening with cotton and the push now in India for more GMOs and more genetically modified organisms of all sorts, being animals and plants, uh, is being pushed. And so we, it, it's a global problem. And what is it? It is that reductionism uh, and, you, and uh, you know, is... Um, a uniformity is trumping these days. And why? It's because with this, you can just simplify the system, make more money uh, fast. And just look out there what's happening in, in, um, in uh, Asia with the oil palm plantation. As far as you can see, everything has been destroyed. Um, in, in Brazil, everything, all the, 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 our diverse agriculture, which used to be there, the forests have been given way to mega fields to grow soybean and, and maize. Um, in Europe, in North America and Canada, we have mega fields of rapeseed. I mean, it just goes on and on. And here, cornfield in America. And you can see, you know, the dark clouds coming. This is not the way we need to do agriculture, and we know it. The resilience of such system, systems is null, nothing. And if they promote climate change, uh, they promote the weather extreme, we can see either floods or droughts. And so we need to become to, to take to our sense to come to our senses and change things. And so with, with all this, we are actually threatening our own uh, future. Uh, as you know, we have uh, a planet we have to live with. That's all there is, is there. And right now we are eliminating uh, our very valuable biodiversity. And I think the whole trend with GMOs is just pushing us even further uh, in narrowing down the biodiversity, which is so important to provide resilience, uh, uh, the capacity to have better yields uh, through breeding uh, in the future. Uh, land changes, again, we are way out in the yellow zone here also because we degrade our land. It takes millions of years to build. And the soil, it takes decades to destroy it, as we know. We have problems with fresh water getting polluted by the pesticides, the herbicides, and all the chemicals used to provide and to make chemicals for agriculture. We have a problem with, phosphor, uh, with uh, phosphorus and nitrogen even bigger. So all these huge use of fertilizer, and then we saw the data in India, you know, are leading to a disaster in terms of climate change, uh, in, in terms of availability of some of these nutrients in the long term. And so again, you know, we need to be, to be aware that agriculture is responsible for most of it. And you can see in these slides, all the black dots there show the impact of agriculture on these uh, planetary boundaries. So clearly we need to change and find a new way of doing agriculture. And um, now, so why, as we know that we should change, why is it not happening? And this has been the big question. I am a member of the IPES Food, the Institute Panel of Experts on Food System. And we actually wrote a paper, uh, a report in 2016 from uniformity to diversity. And we figured out that the problem is with this concentration of power. We have only a few companies left doing fertilizer, pesticides, seeds. Um, and then we have the same situation on the, on, on, on the other side, well, you know, who buys all the products, uh, for example, only a few companies. So this power concentration um, um, promotes more export orientation. Every country wants to become a big exporter of food rather than nourish their own people first. 
America has no need to feed anybody in the world, North or India. I mean, why don't you nourish your own people here in America, in Canada, in my country, Switzerland, and, and everywhere else? I think it can be done. I'm not saying no uh, exchanges, but I think we have to change this. We, we have, for example, the measure of success. And uh, uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva, who I think is also listening, has, has a different measure of success, success than kilogram per hectare. What about health per hectare, you know? Nutrition per hectare, not calories per hectare. I think this is the thing. Short-term thinking, everybody wants to think very quickly. Agriculture is a long-term issue. You know, we want to assure food for the long term. Um, feed the world narrative. I mean, this is the one thing, again, you know, we, we, nobody has to feed the world. We need to nourish ourselves well. And I think one big uh, 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 element is this expectation of cheap food. Cheap food is good for politicians to keep the people quiet. It is uh, harmful for the farmers who never can make actually a, a good living. That's why they actually don't manage the natural resources. They exploit them because they don't know what the choice is. And so again, you know, we need to say that the people in the cities, the people who have money need to pay a, a, a true price for that food. So here we have this issue of concentral power, which stands in the way, the vested interests of the agribusiness are standing in the way of good science, as we just heard from our three previous speakers to actually come true and, and be the law of the land. Um, so how did we create these problems? Or what, what we did, you know, originally we had uh, ecosystem services, we have pollination, pest control, they're all there, we can deal with it. We have water uh, uh, circulation and nutrient cycling. We had a lot of farmers. So what happened, you know, with this, this is given by nature. So uh, what happened is that, and with this, we produced a lot of food and healthy people eating. But then some people figured out, oh, why can't we make money? So if we get rid of these ecosystem services, we can sell more irrigation, we can sell more seeds and GMOs, fertilizers, machinery. Uh, um, and so um, this is what led basically to the agriculture we have today, this dark black agriculture, which contributes to climate change, contributes to, to environmental damage, uh, poverty, uh, um, and so that's why we need to change. And what we're saying is that we need to keep these ecosystem services going. So we had this agriculture here, which is diverse, which where, where people actually can make a living, goes over to an agriculture which is all black. And what's behind it? It is sure those, those interests, versus interests, but also the way we nourish ourselves. We went from actually having way back a, a, a diet which was very green to a diet which is very red, more meat, dairy products, um, um, uh, very refined products. And this has then led to this need for more and more cheap food and processed food. So if we want to go back to an agriculture like we, we have been saying in the international assessment of knowledge, of agricultural knowledge, science, and technology, the ISAD report. You know, there were 400 people around the world, many from India, who wrote this report. We say we need to move to agroecology. We can we can continue the way we're doing things, and that was 10 years ago. That report was boo booed by FAO, which eventually you heard it from Dr. Peter Kenmore. Adopted agroecology in the last few years. It takes time, but it is moving. It is happening. Um, so we say also in this report that subsistence agriculture, as well as industrial agriculture, need to move to a diversified agroecological farming. This is where we need to go. And the, the basis for uh, the, uh, uh, this agriculture is soils. We need to take care of our soils, rebuild and regenerate our soils, uh, very important. And uh, what is agroecology? So agroecology uh, basically is the, the, uh, a set of practices uh, which cover the social, the environmental, and the economic uh, sectors of agriculture, and not only just the economic one. 
And FAO has since also come out with the 10 elements. So I don't have time to go over the details, but you all have access to this uh, PowerPoint. And to look at, okay, what is in agroecology? It is a holistic way of producing our food, um, 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 managing the processing and the consumption. And so um, the, the references are there from uh, Dr. Stephen Gleesman uh, and from FAO, you'll find more details on, again, you know, agroecology and why did we say in this famous report, uh, UN World Bank report 10 years ago, that we need to go agroecology. Uh, there are some very good reasons. Uh, and not only climate change, but again, it's health, it's a health issue. Uh, why we need to change the health of the environment, the health of the people, the health of the animal, the health of the plant. And uh, we have, we, we are blessed right now because we have the sustainable development goals. We have an agreed framework, a global framework where we can actually transform agriculture and we need to transform agriculture to what agroecology in order to meet these targets. We are five years into the process, 10 years left. And if we do not use agroecology, we'll never make it. And we have done uh, in my institutes uh, modeling system models and we can show that if you introduce agroecology, you, you progress in all the goals, uh, all the 17 goals, but only if you use agroecological uh, practices. And that means, again, get rid of pesticides in the system, get rid of all the synthetic uh, fertilizer, uh, get rid of all this GMO uh, discussion because they don't add up anything, as we heard, nothing. Actually, they make it even worse. So I think we have to be clear, the science is there, it needs to be applied right now. And we, we can uh, look even at further, for example, organic cotton has clear environmental and social benefits. This again has been proven, shown left and right. So now let's really, let science you know, move forward. And here, when you look at all the SDGs, you can see where agroecology uh, would contribute, all of them. And so what has to change? What has to change right now uh, to conclude? So research and innovation. So we need more transdisciplinary, integrated and agroecological approaches. We need to do the research there. We have the 50 years of research in green evolution. It's still going on. Look at what AGRA, the, the Gates Foundation, the World Bank and many others are still funding a, a green revolution agriculture. It's bankrupt. Uh, we need to co-create knowledge with the farmers. We, research has to move on and work on farms with the farmers much more than this in the past. And again, we have to invest really in agroecology. So every uh, uh, research station from the CJR, international, national, regional, needs to, to move over to agroecological uh, research. And uh, I had the, the honor uh, four and a half years ago to have a, uh, an inter, uh, uh, a discussion with uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, in his office uh, with uh, Professor Fagan. And uh, the idea was actually to, to see, you know, how could we help um, with our science, you know, get the policies right in Indian government. And I will say that one thing which the Prime Minister told us, he said, you don't have to convince me agroecology and organic farming is good. Just tell me how. Now, okay, so we weren't really prepared for this type of answer, but the how exists. And we have actually submitted uh, a, a paper to the Prime Minister um, to say, okay, how can this be done? So it can be done. So we need coherent policies. You see, you cannot have policies which give subsidies to pesticides on the one side and try to push organic agriculture. It doesn't make sense, right? This is, this, it goes against each other. So again, we need to share better policies among all the policymakers with the, that experience. So that's very important, coherent policies, not what's happening right now. India, Switzerland, my own country, it doesn't matter where you go, it's the same thing. And the contribution of agroecology to global, regional, national commitments. Again, uh, uh, we need to commit to agroecology, organic agriculture, permaculture, natural agriculture, just name them. We have so many good ways of doing agriculture uh, because they will contribute to meet the SDGs. And last but not least, the whole idea about the climate change. You know, this is going to hit us very, very hard, more than COVID, I can tell you. And agriculture, the way it's done today, contributes to it. We're shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't change.
And so I think we have it all uh, uh, nicely uh, packed up. So again, you know, we, we can change course, but everyone has to do its bit. The governments, the donor agencies, uh, we, the scientists, have to push uh, even harder. And the one key element here is that we need a different kind of thinking. You cannot solve the problem with the same thinking that, that uh, created it. You cannot. And we, the scientists, have to be the, the engineers of that change. And Gandhi said that too, right? Be the change you want to see. So, uh, so here, I think uh, I want to give a bit the bigger picture. And again, I want to repeat, the solution on cotton is right there. Uh, it, it, it is um, high density and, and, and short season. It's right there. So I, I don't understand why uh, this is not now policy. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you to my colleagues also for all the presentation before uh, um, I wish you well. Ramu, hello. On mute. Ramu, please unmute. Ramu, on mute. Ramu, are Sorry. you there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Dr. Heron. Uh, as you rightly said in IASCD report, uh, business as usual is not an option. We need to make a shift and uh, we need to focus on the real issues that confronting us. And uh, you re really pointed out the issues like climate change, nutrition security, farmers' profitability, sustainable use of natural resources, etc. And the fact that agroecology delivers and uh, the experiences are right in front of us. How do we work together to take them forward? And uh, there are a number of examples happening already in India though not on cotton, but many other crops. Uh, large programs are happening. Many states are making a shift. Andhra Pradesh, uh, in the name of natural farming, Sikkim in, as organic farming state, have really made a, has set a great examples. Uh, many of them are in the audience now. They're also part of this discussion. Probably we will discuss about them at some other point of time. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Haran, for uh, bringing a macro picture about uh, the cotton and uh, in general about agriculture. Now we open up the floor for discussion. There are several questions uh, which came up uh, from the participants. We had uh, a large number of questions. So we tried to pull up all the questions. Here, uh, what we will do is uh, uh, many of these questions have been already answered by the parts, uh, by the speakers. Uh, we have seen uh, whether it is about pink bollworm, whether it is about resistance development, whether it is about high density plantation, uh, number of uh, these questions have already been answered. So I pick up uh, only a few questions uh, so that we can have uh, uh, a better perspective to be developed. The first uh, thing to uh, Kenmore, Peter Kenmore. Uh, well, the, the pink bowl one case clearly shows that uh, uh, the approach to pest management using GM technology didn't work. So BT technology, particularly if, the, uh, if it is a monophagous pest, uh, it didn't work. And then the life is less than four years. And if that is the case, then uh, we can clearly, uh, do you see the same thing going to happen with uh, Beringial fruit, fruit borer and uh, Paddy stem borer? Both are, again, monophagous pests. And if that's the case, then why are we behind them? Uh, what do you think, Dr. Peter? Um. If, if I understand the question, um, which is the clear failure in the case of pink bollworm with other monophagous pests, and was talking about fruit borer in Brinjal, um, the um, stem borer in paddy and stem borer in rice, uh, in I think they would they would fail exactly the same way. Uh, the the rice case, I can tell you what would happen, which is it wouldn't. You, you put in you put in anything like BT uh, as stem borers have been evolving to overcome resistance uh, bred by conventional means uh, from including polygenic resistance, all sorts of interesting stuff over the last 60, 70 years. Uh, it will destroy 
uh, the BT, it will become re resistant. At the same time, farmers will begin spraying and you'll get, again, rice brown plant hopper outbreaks the same way you did as the classic secondary pest release. Uh, with BT brinjal, I, I know that there are natural enemies in those systems. I know that uh, you would have the same selection pressure for the, for the fruit borer to overcome the BT. I, I see no, no change in this basically the insecticide uh, crisis cycle for either of those. And I don't think we should waste our time. In rice, it's, in, it's not necessary anyway. Uh, there's, there's tremendous amounts of natural enemies. And we've demonstrated that in India. Uh, I mean, I've done it with colleagues personally uh, 38 years ago and uh, on, on and on and on since then. So I think that um, it's chasing the, the wrong target. It's a value capture attempt, as has been stated so clearly by Professor Gutierrez, uh, Dr. Kranti, and, and uh, Hans Herren. So yeah, I don't see any point in, in putting any resources into those uh, events or those uh, uh, pseudo strategies. Thank you. Dr. Kranti, you want to add uh, anything here because uh, you had a long experience on uh, both integrated pest management, uh, on integrated pest management, and you have very closely seen the BT cotton experience. And now the major debate in India is going to be around uh, BT brinjal. I agree with the comments of uh, like of Professor Kenmo, and. Uh, it, uh, it actually didn't really come as a surprise in India that pink bollworm developed resistance, primarily because we were working with hemizygous hybrids. That means uh, each bone still has those non-BT seeds, and this is an internal feeder. That plus the long duration, so it was inevitable. And uh, we walked into the trap. Uh, it's, it's there now, and you can't get rid of it. For almost 30 years, Pink bollworm virtually didn't exist. It was here, there, on and off somewhere. But today it is all across the country. So uh, as long as we continue with the hybrid technology, it's going to be long duration. As long as this long duration continues, pink bollworm is bound to be there. So we need to move towards short duration. Uh Thanks, Dr. Pranti. Now, the, uh, I think they say, uh, now let me take the question with uh, Dr. Andrew. Uh, what was the experience in US uh, about pink bollworm and... Uh... Well, with, uh, with pink bollworm, uh, once they brought in a BT cotton, uh, it preserved it really well, but they developed good uh, resistance um, uh, saving mechanisms. In other words, BT, uh, pink bollworm didn't uh, develop resistance. And when they combined um, sterile male technique, um, BT cotton, they were able to eradicate it over most of the area. So pink bollworm throughout most of the US is no longer a problem. And in fact, the model predicted that um, pink bollworm couldn't enter into the San Joaquin Valley, which is the major cotton growing area of California because it is cold susceptible. So pink bollworm has kind of disappeared from the roadmap in, in the US. Uh, Dr. Kranti, one more question which uh, was coming up is uh, 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 about uh, uh, what we do uh, if, uh, if HDPS has to be promoted and uh, non-GM cotton has to be promoted. Uh, what can be done now? Because we are seeing the problem and uh, uh, solution seems to be right there, <clears throat> but uh, why we are unable to move forward? Uh, there have been a great... Uh number of attempts at the research level. And all I can say is as researchers, the entire team has been doing their best, but then there is a limit to something that they can do. They can't really make policies for the government. Uh, all they can do is like demonstrate that a technology does work. And invariably, like I said, all the trials that have been done, I'm not aware of even a single researcher who uh, has given me a feedback to say that this isn't working. It is just that you need to be a bit careful that these plants do not work bushy, so there's a bit of canopy management there. And that's uh, a bit of science and art, but it works. 
So there is uh, there is a need to uh, intensify. There is a need for government support. I'm sure that uh, this will happen. It's only a matter of time. It is just that uh, like people are waiting. People are tired of uh, the existing technology. It's not really giving them benefits. Like I said, over the past 15 years, there's not even an, an iota of evidence that either the yields have increased or pesticides have decreased. And that's what BT can do, nothing else. So we need alternatives and I'm sure it will happen, but we need to be a bit patient also with, uh, uh, with the scientific teams. And like I said, all colleagues have been doing their best. So let's wait and see. I'm sure it will happen. Yeah. Uh, so here brings back one of the questions. So several people uh, while registering, uh, one of the question asked, if you are raising so many problems, then uh, uh, what did biosafety tests do? And then uh, why decisions are not taken by the government uh, about regulating uh, these technologies? That's one of the question, most frequently asked question which we see. Uh, but uh, I see from uh, the research, there is a lot of evidence that uh, alternatives are possible and then, but the decision is not around that. Uh, whereas a uh, lot of decisions have been taken to push technologies which are unsustainable. So probably it has something to do with the decision-making system uh, and the regulatory system than the research system in this country. Uh, one more question to you, Dr. Pranti. We are, we are seeing uh, a large area under uh, herbicide tolerant cotton happening and uh, no reg uh, decisions on regulating it is happening and last year we have seen uh, uh, prime minister's office itself taking a study and then again uh, saying around 20 percent of the cotton in india is herbicide tolerant and if such illegal spread is happening uh, how do you see this uh, from a regulatory point of view it's actually very worrisome because uh, like primarily we are talking about small scale farmers uh, using pesticides and in 2018 it was uh, when it was uh, i just can't tell you how bad i felt uh, when there were farmer deaths when they were mixing uh, like glyphosate with pesticides and it gets onto them in small scale farming systems uh, usage of uh, pesticides like glyphosate uh, is very very difficult and here in the United States, uh, the courts have actually ruled in favor uh, of all those litigants and not just one, there were thousands of cases. And the last we heard, and again, the, the compensation that was being granted was in millions of dollars. So it is, uh, the last we heard was that there was a working compromise that was being uh, worked out between the company and the affected persons. So I can understand in an industrialized uh, country, this is happening. The core point there is we are talking of a pesticide that has been categorized by the World Health Organization under class 2A. We are not talking of someone, you know, like a scientific group speaking about it. This is a class 2A, it is a possible carcinogen. We need to be careful. And in the hands of an illiterate farmer, a smallholder, um, we know, all of us in India know, what kind of care they take. And here is a chemical that can cause cancer. Do I want to push them into it with this technology is a big question mark. So I would want all of us, everyone who deals with it to be as careful as possible and to evaluate risk instead of pushing the technology and saying that here is a remedy for high yields. It is not. It is just a weed management technology, but then there are risks to it. And in India, uh, Weed management also provides employment and it provides employment to at least 33 to 35 persons uh, per hectare, which is good. I would, I would want that to continue instead of pushing towards uh, this herbicide, which I don't know. I mean, I would be very careful. I'd be doubly careful and, with that. And in fact, uh, many states, it is not... Uh been permitted to use in the crop fields, but uh, the uh, the continued sales uh, are happening and it's a clear regulatory failure uh, what we have seen. Uh, and uh, one more question again, Dr. Kranti was about uh, 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 the contamination issue of BT Bikaneri in Arma, what has happened. Uh, and uh, uh, so the probably if uh, BT bikini Norma was contaminated, uh, even the non-BT would be contaminated. So I think contamination issue is uh, one uh, serious concern about GM cotton. So how do you talk about it? Because today, tomorrow, yesterday, if it was about cotton, tomorrow it will be the same case with paddy and uh, bringer. 
and uh, india being the center of origin for these two crops uh, like we did a mistake again uh, without looking into the pest management thing uh, are we going to do the same mistake about contamination issue also it's it's a larger question it's a tough question to answer primarily contamination happens because cotton is an often cross pollinated crop and uh, many of my colleagues many of plant breeders uh, had been telling us all the time that their germplasm lines were being contaminated it's it, it could be pollen flow it could be a bumblebee coming from somewhere it could be a honey bee coming from somewhere mostly bumblebees so you you can't really stop them but then uh, like plant breeders do maintain some amount of nuclear seeds here we are talking about our shrinking diversity it is the varietal diversity i'm not addressing the larger issue of biodiversity which can be still far more serious but here when varietal diversity has shrunk it is also true that uh, most of our elite varieties that were developed by the public sector uh, they all uh, i mean they are shrinking but our breeders are also good they are trying their best to maintain but contamination is a very very serious issue i do not know where exactly the answer lies but still uh, uh, we 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 need a lot of support uh, from the infrastructure i mean in terms of the government like how to maintain our germplasm how to maintain their purity and all that yes but that is a problem certain uh, dr kanmur you want to add something thank you yeah. dr ramu just just on the on the Next. question yeah. of H, of ht in the future uh, the uh, evolution selection and evolution of resistance to glyphosate uh, is spreading all around the world certainly in australia was one of the first ones uh, then south america now north america there's no question that you're you're moving up towards that inflection point where where it will take off so there's no there's no other uh, future uh, with the with the ht and the fact that that's 20% of the area uh, with illegal plantings of of herbicide tolerant uh, cotton means that you're setting yourself up already for disaster that's all yeah. thanks dr kanbur uh, dr hans uh, yeah i just wanted to uh, and, uh, uh, how do yeah, we get the uh, policy makers to listen Uh, yeah how do we <laughs> and also we, we, we have to yeah. have clear messages i think you know so so that that's the, the one thing and again we have to pull together our evidence in a in a way and then talk to those decision makers you know um we need to get out of talking just among ourselves i think that's the the, the one important thing we have done too much of it um because we should not be shy uh, to come forward with what we know when you see that you know on herbicide tolerance we are not stacking up like five different genes to make them resistant to five different herbicides because it's of the resistance i mean you know it it's running forward i mean we're never going to be done just like with insecticide i think you know there there's no difference and i think that's what we have to start to make clear to our decision makers and i think that if we were to start with um uh doing true costing you know if we were to start to really what is the true cost of all these pesticides in the environment uh, on our health um and 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 that would be part of the price they will be out of business tomorrow i can tell you it's impossible i mean if you add this up you know which what the community pays in terms of healthcare of 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 uh, regenerating soil on, on finding new uh, uh resistance uh, genes and god knows what you know sort of all these costs are enormous out there and so if you start to add them up they have no chance against an, uh, an agriculture which we have been proposing for years now uh, which um, uses nature um, for pest management for them we know it works it works we use uh, cover crops to to improve the soil to uh, manage water better so all this has been shown it can be done uh, so let's pull our uh, uh think some uh, network problem uh, looks like there is a network problem uh, dr andrew yes so and can i hear from you uh, once again 
yeah dr hans is back uh, dr hans do you want to continue uh, and add few more points no no i i'm i'm done thank you sorry okay. I, I, uh, dr randy quit here and there yeah sorry yeah um, but all of these um herbicides um for example in the midwest and the us they're going off into the waters they're chelating agents they tie up micronutrients they uh, cause um abnormalities in amphibians whose uh, skin is really penetrated by them so two-headed frogs and you know five-legged frogs and so on are 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 are, are common and in addition to that uh, the fact that uh, just thousands of these cases of of um, non-hodgkin's lymphoma are winding through the courts so um mm. it it's a big, it's a big problem and uh, and finally the solution to at least to part of it is going to be legal now one of the questions that uh, ask they don't put for example bt into um high density short season cotton and the obvious answer is the planting density so if if it uh, at two plant um a meter square you have a certain cost at 16 at the same technology would that be eightfold the cost and that almost uh um untenable to start with thank you thanks dr randy and uh, before uh, we conclude uh, can i ask uh, the speakers to add uh, their last remarks can we uh sir with dr peter no the last uh, remarks before we close the session i'm i'm delighted that the uh and that you've got uh well somewhere above 350 people uh and i think that uh, in among those people are many of those committed scientists i mentioned earlier professor amar nayak uh, from Uh, bubaneshwar uh others uh, that are that are working in the country um and i think that this should be uh, a strong message of support uh, for taking an ecological view of agriculture and a real scientific view and not simply um so called research that serves only to uh develop the proprietary products i think that uh, there's been too long a distortion where uh, science was overlooked ignored and and closed down before it could get results uh that has to be cleared up uh in terms of of helping out uh, the system and i think as i said that farmer groups uh Dr. Rama knows these well and has worked with them for a long time uh farmer groups must be uh put in the lead in uh adaptive research in their own fields with their own local knowledge and history and uh without that uh there's too much chance of going to a default situation where a central either public or more likely corporate private um technology then dominates uh and will enter the cycle of failure again so uh i think there's lots of room for hope dr kranti said that as well i see that hope being largely uh within social groups uh, among farmers and in, in their own communities thank you very much for the chance to participate thanks dr kanmore i think uh, the our own experience of non pesticidal management and natural farming and the pradesh shows that this is the approach we need to take uh, i hope government uh, looks into it and uh, many more states will make the shift uh, dr kranti oh, me want to ask you your last Andrew. comments ah, well i'd like to address um, a couple of issues one i found it rather curious that the planting density in india was so low that it was long season cotton that it was hybrid and when i started thinking about this and doing the analysis it became clear that the value capture mechanism was really what it was all about that in 
developed countries, US, Australia, other places, uh, intellectual property rights are protected via legal means. If you plant contaminated seeds, you could end up losing your farm by lawsuits from the company. But in seed, say, seed, seed saving India, where you have small farms, that's not possible. And the hybrid cotton serves the mechanism for keeping farmers from saving seed. Because what turns out in, in terms of the seed uh, is something that's not really all that good or predictable. So hybrid technology may have been proposed to increase yield and quality, but I really think it's been maintained to control uh, the seed and, 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 the, and the, uh, the purchase of the seed. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it was a clear message. Dr. Kranti, want to add on? Yes, thank you so much uh, once again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Indian agriculture faces a lot of challenges and cotton specifically faces still more. Uh, the problem that I can see is that we have enormous potential, enormous bioresources, the best climate that cotton can ever get. It's, it's all tropical, there's adequate rainfall. Still, we aren't delivering. We are not able to uh, like harness our full potential. We've got probably the largest number of scientists in the world, at least cotton scientists in the world, but still we are not able to do that. These challenges must be addressed. First, at least recognize what these challenges are. Instead of getting sidetracked and distracted by something so small like BT cotton, it is, like I said, it is just a pesticide. Why is it that the whole nation gets obsessed with it as if cotton is BT and without BT, there is no life? It's, that's not true. We need sustainable systems. We need to get to our agroecology. Our soils are getting degraded. Indian soil health, the soil organic carbon is really, really poor. In some cases, we see something like 0.3%, 0.4% pathetic. So we need, we need to address those issues first. Good soils make a healthy crop. And a healthy crop has a good ecosystem. And we need to build on those. How, how can we do that? How can we move away from most of these agro uh, I mean, most of these agrochemicals uh, should be our priority and good science can do that. Good science can help that. So my appeal to all the scientists who are here in this and also thank you for giving me this platform is let's start working on agroecology uh, and ensure that India gets to the top and that the smallholder farmer will win eventually uh, with sustainable systems that can give them good yields and profitable yields, good livelihood, and good living. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Pranti. Uh, Dr. Hans? Yeah, uh, thanks also to the organizer for the opportunity uh, and organizing this webinar. I think it was extremely important to do, to do this uh, at this particular time. Um, looking at challenges, I think that, as I did mention in my short little sort of few points, um, that with, you know the GM genetic engineering is a technology looking for an application because we can do something. Let's go out there and see what can we do with this thing. Uh, all the, and all right, oh, it's a bit you know, like with the pesticides too. You know, I mean, all of a sudden we have something. Oh, it kills the bugs. Oh, let's do more of it. Uh, not really thinking, you know, about the system all around it. So and, and so where is this coming from? This is coming from the private sector who has for objective uh, profit. I mean, this is the way things work. And the more profit, the better. And so never mind who will suffer afterwards. Um, so, so it is uh, pushing, is a technology um, um, and the green evolution also behind it actually, being pushed by the private sector fertilizer, pesticide, and seeds. I mean, these are really the big one, but also the agro, the machinery uh, folks uh, are the same. I mean, it's also the mechanization, data collection. So you can see all this uh, uh, a number of people who uh, will benefit from having uh, uh, the farmer be become dependent on those inputs. So destroy everything, and then we we'll replace it with something else, which you have to buy and, and pay. So to me, it looks like we have to stand firm uh, with our evidence, uh, talk to the decision makers and show them, you know, how this is actually 
economically better for the country. Uh, we need to talk to the finance minister, not so much the, the minister of agriculture. I think we need to go and see, okay, wh where are those blockages? Who is listening to those people and making those decisions? And I think that we'll get somewhere. And as I mentioned also, uh, let's use the SDGs as a vehicle uh, to make those changes right now. I think we have, it's agreed. We don't have to go mess about and ask, oh, have you agreed to make changes? It's been agreed. And we can propose something intelligent there with all our good research showing that we don't need a pesticide, we don't need to make people sick, the environment and sick. We don't have to promote climate change. We can actually uh, work uh, to make life better, in particular for the smallholder farmers, the farmers in general, actually, big or small, because they're all actually suffering uh, from this problem. So, again, thank you very much. And um, uh, I'm available anytime if you need some support uh, in some ways. Uh, I'll be happy to, to communicate with whoever needs to. So, again, thank you very much uh, for everyone's listening. And a good night. Thanks, Dr. Helen. In good fact, uh, many of my team members are saying there are a number of, uh, many more questions which they are still compiling. And uh, I request the uh, also speakers, we will be sharing them with you. And then probably offline, we can take the responses and then we'll put them together. And uh, before we close, uh, I also request all the participants to share your feedback on the, uh, uh, the, on the Facebook pages and also the emails which are given in the chat box. You can do that. And and uh, before closing, uh, may I request uh, Kapil Shah, who is uh, my co-organizer, to share his uh, few points? It's OK. Uh, everything well mentioned from international fora to international fora. And this whole event was not only meant for India, for BT cotton, for BT technology. It is very much about the direction of agriculture where the global agriculture, Indian agriculture needs to move uh, for the benefit of the new generation. So thank you all. I know all of you, I was harassing to the speakers. You are in the middle of night, about to be approaching middle of the night. And uh, in, in uh, thank you so much. You spared your time, energy, resources, expertise in global solidarity. I, we also thank all the participants to be with us uh, thank you so much, Ramu, to you too. And uh, uh, on that note, I thank uh, all of our speakers for uh, so very clearly showing us the evidence and uh, reasoning about how BT cotton failed to live up to the uh, promises made uh, to the farmers and is uh, related to several new problems which it came up, uh, which gave up. Uh, there is also a clear evidence that problems have been exorbitated and uh, that such uh, technologies are an extension of failed treadmill technologies like synthetic pesticides. The impact has been variable and small and marginal farmers and rain fed areas are worst affected. This in fact uh, is the reality which is in front of us. And uh, the speakers have clearly mentioned that the failure of BT cotton is not just a failure of a product or the technology behind it. It's a classic representation of uh, the reductionistic thinking and where unsound signs of plant protection and uh, faulty direction of agricultural development policies can lead to. Meanwhile, the reality also is that there are successful uh, sustainable alternatives in cotton cultivation related to Indian species of cotton related to agronomy and also that address farmers profitability need at the market's end. Uh, these alternatives also don't have uh, cotton as a monocrop, but uh, cost of food security at the cost of food security or as a water thirsty crop demanding more inputs from the market. We request policymakers in India to pay attention to the truth uh, change their mindset, which is uh, conditioned by the unfounded claims of biotech industry and drive Indian agriculture on the path of uh, real Atmanirbhar Bharat. I also thank uh, Kisan Swaraj Group for letting us use in this online platform. Uh, we indeed had uh, more than 1,000 participants, so we couldn't use our own platform's uh, Zoom account. So uh, thanks, Asha Kisan Swaraj Group. And uh, also thanks are due for all volunteers who work behind the scenes to make this happen. And uh, I would like to inform all the participants that there is another webinar scheduled on uh, 27th August at 4 p.m. discussing the rene uh, renewed threat of BT brinjal in India with a new BT brinjal edging to towards regulatory approvals very fast. Please do join this webinar uh, if you are interested. We also have a speaker from Bangladesh uh, sharing their experiences. 
the details are uh, uh, shown here. We are also showing you the social media pages and handles uh, uh, of the organizers. We hope uh, you will go to these pages, uh, like them, follow them, and give your feedback. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, I thank uh, our eminent speakers from bottom of my bottom of my heart once again, and it is quite late uh, in the night for many of you. And uh, you still accommodated our request to meet our convenience. Uh, your short analysis and crystal clear evidence has been very informative and useful. I also thank all participants for their enormous response and concern. Thank you. We keep doing such uh, things in future. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.